Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, we're going to read really quickly here as we remain standing. Matthew chapter 24. And and we're going to read this text because I want everybody to see where this series was birthed out of. This is where the Lord birthed our signs of the times series. Matthew 24. We're going to start in verse in verse 3. Can we pull it up on the screen, please? 24, verse 3. As he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the he being Jesus, by the way. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Jesus answered them and said to them, See to it that no one misleads you, for many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, and will mislead many. You will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not frightened, for those things must take place. But that is not yet the end. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom in various places throughout the earth. There will be famines and earthquakes. But all these things are merely the beginning of birth pains. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and will kill you. And you will be hated by all the nations because of my name. At that time, many will fall away and will betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and will mislead many. Because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end, the one who endures to the end, the one who fixes their eyes on Jesus, the one who endures to the end, that one will be saved. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached. This gospel of the kingdom of God. There's a lot of gospels being preached. Prosperity gospel and this gospel. and that. It's the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. His kingdom come. His will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's where the king rules. The gospel of his kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations. Then at that time, then at that time, that will be the sign of the times that the end will come. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the gospel of the kingdom. We thank you for it. God, we thank you that your word, your word is living and it's active. Hallelujah. And Lord, I just pray that your word would be like a seed planted on fertile soil today in each and every one of our hearts. Holy Spirit, come. Come for the preaching of your word. Anointed, I pray. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. Before you're seated, tell your neighbor, you love them in the Lord. Amen. Tell them, say, I love you in the Lord. I love you in the Lord. Good morning, church. <clears throat> good morning. Well, I know it's so good to see all of you. You guys happy to be in the house of God this morning? Yeah. Cool. Don't get too excited, though. I wouldn't want to fall off the stage from your shouting to take me back. No, but it really is good to see everyone. Well, I'm going to hop right into this thing um, this morning. Is that okay? We're just going to hop right into it and really allow the Lord to do something in the midst of us during such a a crazy, crazy time. And and look, so man, I've been praying about something. Praise the Lord, right? I've been praying. Thank you for praying. (laughs) Praise God. But I've been praying something specifically. And the thing that I've been praying is that the Lord would really show up and touch us. Really touch us. I'm not talking about showing up to make us feel good. 
Although I have, I have nothing against feeling good. I like to feel good, right? I do. I enjoy it. But, but not to just show up to make us, us feel good. And, and here's, here's what I've realized over the 40 years, right, of, of living my life. Feelings are very, very fickle. They're very fickle. Like, we'll wake up in the morning and we'll feel good, right? We'll, we'll get up, we'll, we'll feel good. We're excited about the day. And so we'll get all dressed and we'll get ready. And, and a couple hours later, we're on our way to wherever we're going that we're excited about going. Probably not work for most of us, but let's say we're going to the mall to buy something. That would be my love language, right? It's like some new kicks or something. So we're excited, right? And all of a sudden, somebody cuts us off. We go from feeling good to feeling angry in a moment. In an instant. Why? Because human beings' feelings are, are so fickle. We no longer feel good. Now we, we feel anger in just a, a moment. So, so I haven't been praying that we would feel good. I've been praying that the Lord would touch us and transform us. To transform us. But, but you know what the church has done? This is what the church has done. We've treated Jesus like a genie in the bottle. Like, like we can rub him a little bit lift our hands a little bit, rub him, and he, and he, poof, he pops out. And he's going to grant us three wishes. This is how we've, we've treated him. And because this is the way we viewed God and the way we viewed Jesus, like a big Santa Claus here to give us whatever we, we desire to have, because we view him this way, we think his main objective is to make us feel good. So, so if we don't feel good, it must not be God. If, if it doesn't feel good, then man, I don't know. God's not here. Gotta be the enemy because it doesn't feel, because it doesn't feel good, right? Like this is, this is what we do. But see, the fact of the matter is this. Jesus' main objective is to transform us, to conform us into his image and into his likeness. That's it. That's his main objective in our lives is to completely transform us, is to rid us of us, Amen. completely demolish us and who we are as human beings. So many times I hear people say, well, it's just who I am. You, gotta, you, you just got to accept it's who I am. Right? But, no, no, hold up, hold up. The Bible says something different. <laughs> The Bible says he wants to transform us from glory to glory, changing the very essence of who we are. The very nature of who we are, changing it and replacing it with, with him. Matter of fact, Jesus says it this way. He says, if anyone wishes to come after me, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself. Pick up his cross every day. In other words, crucify his flesh. He's trying to crucify you. <laughs> it's a little morbid at 915. <laughs> it's a little much, Pastor. <laughs> He's trying to crucify us. Pick up your cross and, and, and follow me. For whoever seeks to save his life will lose it. But those who seek to lose their life for my sake will find it. They'll find it. Paul says it this way in Galatians 2.20. I love this verse. He says, I have been what? Crucified. Look at your neighbor. Say, be crucified. Come on. <laughs> Be crucified, praise God. I have been crucified in Christ. It's no longer I who live, but it's, it's Christ who lives in me. This life I live in the flesh, I now live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Very, very clear, we must die. That's very clear. It's a, it's a commandment, straightforward commandment. We must die. There's no loophole, there's no... We've got to be crucified. We've got to allow Christ to crucify us and our desires and our agendas and what we want. And look, I say all that. I say all that to say, because listen, I'm going somewhere. Come on, look at your neighbor time. Say he's going somewhere. He's going somewhere. Yeah, yeah. I say all that to say this. At times, it doesn't feel good to follow Jesus. <laughs> doesn't feel good to follow him. At times when Jesus shows up, man, it doesn't, it doesn't feel good, but hear me, it's always good that he shows up. Yeah. <laughs> it may not feel good, but I promise you it's always good. And so I've been praying over these past several weeks and will continue to do so. Pray, Lord, transform us. 
show up and, and, and begin and, and start with me, man. Crucify, crucify me. Crucify all of us so that it's no longer I, so, that, so that it's no longer you, so, so it's no longer we who live, but it's Christ who lives in us. Imagine what the church could do huh? if we would allow Christ to crucify us. And go after him and not worry about nothing else, just him. What he would do and the glory that would fall upon his people. What if? And man, I'm believing that God is going to do that. I believe he's going to continue to do that for us. Amen. Are you ready for that? Come on, tell your, tell your neighbor, say, hey, if you're not ready, tell them. If you're not ready, get ready. <laughs> get ready. But I've really been, been praying for that. And as I was engaging, right, with the Lord about all that, when I was talking to him about all that stuff there, crucifying us and what that looks like, and this is what he, this is what he said to me. And it was, it was very clear. He said, I want you to remind them, remind you, or to inform you, right? Or to inform you, because if you never knew it, how can you you'd be reminded of something you never knew? But he was like, I want you to tell them or inform them that in my word, right, in his word, in the infallible word of God, in the place that, that, that God literally continues to reveal himself to humanity for those who get in his word, tell them that, that in the word that I call them my beloved. That I call them my beloved. The Greek word for beloved is agapeatos. That's the Greek word for there. Agapeatos, which comes from the root word agape. We're going to Bible college today. Amen. We're going to learn a little Greek. Agape, which means the highest form of unconditional love. The highest form. That's agape love. It's the highest form of love, which by the way, right, only God can do. <laughs> can only be done and given by God and initiated by God. Agape, we as human beings have no ability to agape anything or anyone without Christ crucifying us. Without Christ being the center of our lives, it's impossible to agape. It's impossible to. And, and you know what else? It's, it's really hard for us also to receive that type of love. Super hard for us to receive agape love. But yet God chooses to call us his beloved, agapeatos, which means only worthy of love. When he speaks to you, when he speaks about you, he says, hey, my beloved, you're only worthy of love. How incredible. Listen, if that doesn't get us excited, I'm really not sure what will in this life at all. If this doesn't give us joy in spite of the way we feel, nothing will. Nothing will. He says you are only worthy of love. Those who have given their lives to Christ, those who have decided to allow Christ to crucify us, he says you are my beloved. You're my agapeatos. I like that word, agapeatos. Come on, somebody. I might just start using it. <laughs> You're only worthy of love. He uses that over 40 times throughout the Bible when addressing his people, when talking about his people. It's a beautiful, beautiful truth. And he wanted me to remind you of it. He wanted me to tell you and inform you that that's how he, that's how he sees you. And the reason he wanted to tell you that, because there is a motive behind it, is so that when he tells you something to do, that will crucify you, that will cause you to have to die to you in that moment, you'll remember. When he asks you to do things that just don't feel good to do, you'll remember, wait a minute, I can do it. I don't love to do it. I don't like doing it. I don't even feel good while I'll do it, but I'm his agapeatos. I know he's asking me to do this because I'm only worthy of love. And so he's asking me to do it because he, he loves me because he loves me. So in response to his agape love to us, we realize 
we are only worthy of love. And when hard things, when God asks us to do super hard things that crucify our flesh, we can do it. We can do it anyway. God, because I know, I know how you view me. I know who you say that I, that I am. Let me try to explain it this way. Okay, let me explain it to you this way. So there's only a couple people in my life that have the ability to really speak into my life, that really have the ability that can walk up to me anytime, any place, and say, dude, get your head out of your rear end. Enough. Knock it off. You're really stinking right now in life as a human being, and we need you to change the course of your, of, of your decisions right now. I only have a couple people that can do that in my life. I actually would tell you, I only have a couple people. I don't have a bunch of people doing that, okay? <laughs> and one of them people are my beautiful wife. My beautiful wife, praise the Lord, yeah. Yeah, she, she loves every minute of it. <laughs> but my wife has the authority to come up to me and tell me super hard things that don't feel good to me. And I promise you, she don't spare my feelings whatsoever. Uh, let me give you a for instance. You want a for instance? <laughs> you guys want one? <laughs> Praise the Lord. I'll give it to you. So last week, after I was done preaching to you guys, right? I was done. Go back in my office like I do every single week. Go in there, start praying. Lord, fill me back up so I can preach again, right? Lord, help me to be able to feed your people. Help me feed your sheep. And I'm going in there trying to get filled back up by the Holy Ghost. And my beautiful wife comes following me in the door. So I look at her. I said, hey, honey, how'd I do? <laughs> Stupid question. She said, not very good. I said, huh? She said, I, I got to be honest with you. Wasn't, wasn't very good. She says, you could do way better. I'm going to need you to do that. I'm going to need you to do better. And, and listen, of course, I'm, I'm telling you, I got a little frustrated <laughs> and probably a lot uh, defensive, right? Like, and I was like, well, my goodness, Julie. See how it went from honey to Julie? See, she knows, she knows, <laughs> she knows. When I start saying Julie and not honey, it's on, right? <laughs> we're going to go at it a little bit here. And matter of fact, we're still going through it a little bit, so I'm working through it right now while I'm preaching. I'm using this as like my, I don't know, my, my psychology says or whatever, right? Like my psychiatrists are all of you guys right now. So working through this, working through this, working through this. God's faithful, God's faithful. But... But I said, my goodness, Julie, I mean, do you know the week that I just had? I mean, my week was jam-packed last week, jam-packed. I had two weddings, two rehearsals, two ceremonies on the same day. I had so much going on, I didn't know where I was at half the time. I think you can cut me a little slack. She looks at me very, very calmly, very calmly, no expression at all. My wife's real calm. It probably even makes me more mad, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> How can you stay calm right now when I am seething with anger? <laughs> very calmly, she's like, hey, I'm just telling you, wasn't very good. I know you were doing all those things you were doing, but you didn't do good on this one. But here's the good news. <laughs> she tore me down to build me up. She said, but here's the good news. You got another opportunity coming. Go do better. <laughs> Literally drops the mic and walks out of my office, <laughs> leaving me to... <laughs> To be, really, to be really angry by all by myself. I couldn't even take it out on anybody because she's gone. Yeah. Ghost. I'm like, oh, my Lord. After the 1030 service, I learned my lesson. This was unsolicited. I didn't ask her again. Matter of fact, I didn't want to look at her. You know what I mean? Like, I got done. I went straight back there, packed my stuff up. I had it on my back. I was marching out. You know what I mean? Didn't say a word. She said, hey, by the way, you did great. <laughs> I said, it's too late. I'm sleeping on the couch. <laughs> so I guess you guys in the 830 service, I owe you an apology. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't communicate the message cleanly enough for, for my wife's liking for you. Um, but the good news is 1031, I guess I did. So you can go on there and watch it. That's what we posted. So, but my point is in all of that, my point is my wife has the ability and the authority to tell me really, really hard things that doesn't feel good to me at all. And you know why? Because I know she loves me. Like, I don't question for a moment my wife's devotion and her love to me. 
Not ever. I know whatever she's saying to me, even though it don't feel good to me, it is to make me better. Case in point, last week, a better preacher. And I guess I listened to her advice. Right? But the things that she tells me, super hard truths, and she'll do this in many areas of my life, believe me, praise God, many. But it's to better me, it's to make me a better husband, a better dad, a better man of God. My wife's desire for me is to specifically be a, a man after God's own heart with everything that is within me, hungry for him, devoted to him, sold out to him. That's her desire for me. And, and because I know this, that she only desires to, to prosper me, she can tell me things that don't feel good to me. And I can receive it from her. I can receive it. See, we've got we've to know what God says about us, how God looks at us, so that we can receive really hard things from you. Things that don't feel good to us at times. Because he's doing it. Because he does want to prosper you, not to harm you. To give you a hope and a future. He wants you to be able to endure to the end. Because the only type of saving faith is faith that endures to the end. And so, in our text today, Matthew chapter 24, we're going to look at a very clear instruction that Jesus gives us. A very clear one in the midst of all the warnings. That it, I think at times, right, and listen, this isn't going to feel good to us, praise the Lord. <laughs> it's not going to feel good. It's not going to feel good to us. Well, at least it didn't to me. Maybe it will to you, but it didn't to me. Praise the Lord when the Lord was, was talking to me about this. But in the midst of all of these warnings, right, Jesus, in these few verses, in these few verses, he lays out all these different signs of the times and all these different warnings, right? There will be great earthquakes and great famines. There'll be great storms and, and nations will rise against nations and wars and rumors of wars and all these different things. And all this is going to happen before the end of the earth can even come. And because of all these tragic things, we can, we can miss the instruction that he puts in there very clearly. We may look past what God is trying to reveal in the moment. And so as I was, was studying this text and studying the passage, the Lord took me to verse 12, just straight to verse 12. He said, this is, this is where my people have to hear me. All these other things, really, to be honest with you, these things are just, they're just signs. Really, at the end of the day, none of it matters because we're going to be with our king. Like, it doesn't even matter. Do whatever you got to do because I'm going home. So, so whatever. I'm in the, in the world, but I'm not of it. So this is at my home. I'm passing through it. I am an alien and a sojourner in this place, and I feel like it at times too. Praise the Lord. So whatever, those signs of the times, it's fine to know them. Cool. But I don't focus on them because it really don't matter. But verse 12 matters. Verse 12 matters. And it's an instruction. And this is what it says. It says, because lawlessness has increased, most people's love will grow cold. How many of you realize lawlessness has increased in our time? I mean, for real. I think we can look objectively at that. I don't think you gotta be a partisan to say lawlessness is increasing. I don't think you have to. Democrat, Republican, I think you both can look at it and say, eh, eh. lawlessness is, is definitely increasing. I mean, we can literally see people hating, people fighting, people killing, people rioting, people looting, people burning entire city blocks to the ground. And while those people are doing that, you have other people saying, well, it's understandable. It's understandable. While others are encouraging this type of behavior. Others are bailing them out, so there's no consequences to their actions at all, none. So because of those things, a sign of our time is lawlessness is increasing. And the Lord said, because of this, the love of many will grow cold. And in John chapter 13, verse 34 through 35, Jesus gives us a clear instruction. He says, a new commandment I give you a new commandment that I give you. Love one another. Even as I have loved you. You guys know where I'm going. Yeah. You know where I'm going. Love each other as I have loved you. 
And by this, all will know that you're mine. All will know that you're my disciples by the love you have for one another. The world will know you are my followers. The world will know you are my disciples. They will know that I have called you my beloved by your love. By the way, you love one another. Did you know love is the calling card for the Christian? Our love is our calling card. That's what it is. Whether we like it, whether it makes us feel good, whether we enjoy it, love is our, our calling card. See, last week what we talked about was all the different narratives that are being shaped in our time. Tons of narratives all the time. Nobody even knows what to look at and believe. Praise the Lord. Because there's so many narratives. And what we talked about is because of all the different narratives, it is imperative to hang on to the truth, which is Jesus. He's the way, the truth, and the life. So we got to hold on to him. And this is a direct warning from the truth to us. A direct warning. The love of many will grow cold because of lawlessness. But the one who endures to the end, those one will be saved. They'll, they'll be the ones saved. The ones who, who love and continue to love. Continue to love me and continue to love humanity enough to tell them about me. Those, those that do that to the end will be saved. Even in the midst of lawlessness, love. See, Jesus knows the danger of, of lawlessness is, man, it can really cause us to hate each other. It can cause so much hate to start to rise up in the deepest parts of us. Hate those who are acting out. Hate those that are agree with people who are acting out. Dis, even disregard those who are acting out and disregard those who are encouraging them to act out. Just completely wipe our hands off them. But Jesus gives a clear instruction. Those who love to the end will be saved. Now, it's funny to me and not ha-ha funny, but, but funny in the way of, it just is funny to me. Because I promise you, I will get so many things that people will say to me, about me and to me, because of me preaching love in the midst of lawlessness and, and divided times. I will guarantee it. I will guarantee it. I'll get all types of, of comments. Wanting to parse my words. Saying, well, well, pastor, wait a minute. Jesus isn't talking about loving lawlessness and loving the people, lawless people. That's not what he's talking about. That's not what he's saying there. He, he, couldn't, be, he couldn't be saying that. I mean, do you see what these people are doing? How they're acting, how they're, how they're responding. But they're, they're acting crazy. Like you, you, can't, you can't love that, that type of people. What's wrong with you? You're taking it out of context, pastor. I mean, Jesus there is simply talking about loving him to the end. Because he talks about people trying to mislead them and da 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 and then he goes into that. And So you're taking it out of context. The problem with a lot of people is they don't know full counsel of God's word. They just don't know it. Right. They don't know it, but then they want to talk about it. I'm like, praise the Lord. Praise God. See, the problem with speaking that way, because hear me, hear me. The Bible reaffirms the Bible. Yeah. All of scripture is confirming and reaffirming other scripture. And so if you don't know the full counsel of God's word, you can be really, really confused. But see, the, the, the Bible is, is very clear. Matthew chapter five, Jesus is saying this. You have heard it said that you should love your neighbor, but hate your enemy. But I tell you, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Pray for those. Love your enemies and pray for those who, who persecute you so that you may be, here, the love, the love, the love, so that you may be called sons and daughters of the king. That's Jesus' words, not mine. It's his, not mine. Luke chapter six, Jesus again reaffirming this and confirming it again. Do good to those who hate you. <laughs> Bless those who curse you. Wow. You, you mean I've got to bless those that, that are acting lawless? Like I've got to pray for them and, and love them enough to, to pray for them? You, you mean what? That's, what? that's what it says. Love those who, who mistreat you. <laughs> Praise God. 
If you love those who, who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. Even those who aren't my beloved, even those who haven't given their lives to me, even those who haven't been crucified, they even do that garbage. That's what he's saying. You can always hear the tone. Even they, sinners do that. If you do good to those that do good to you, there is absolutely no credit to you whatsoever. Wow. But I say to you, love those. Love your enemies and do good and expect nothing in return at all. Nothing. Then your reward will be great. If you do this to the end, then you will be saved. This is what he is saying right here, black and white. Then if you do this, if you love your enemies and bless those that hate you and bless those that curse you and, and, and love those that disagree with you, if you do those things, then you are considered a son and a daughter of the most high. Because even he is kind to the ungrateful and evil man. Even he is. Be merciful just as your heavenly father is merciful. Did you know the Bible says you gotta give mercy to obtain it? Man, I try to look for opportunities to give it because I need it. <laughs> I'm telling you, I need his mercy. I need it brand new every morning, man. Every morning, Jesus, I need you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for new more mercies today, God. First John chapter four says it this way. If someone says, I love God, but hates his brother, they are a liar. What? They're a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he can see cannot love a God he cannot see. Mm. Very clear instructions, love, very, very clear. Straightforward, like there is no caveat to love. Did you know that? Like there's no amendment to our love for people. There's no amendment for it. There's no loophole that we can find in a back door through the Old Testament or something. Like, you know what I mean? Like you, you can't go there and get around the backside and, and not love people, not be a Christ follower. That is our calling card. We must continue to love even in the midst of, of the signs of the times that are happening. People need to see the love of God more now than ever. They need to see it now more, more than ever. See, people need the people of God to be people of God. Yeah. Ain't that crazy? That's a crazy concept. The world needs the church to be the church. But what's happened is, is the church is acting like the world, looking like the world. It, it makes sense that it's happening out there, but it's really sad that it's happening in, in here. It's a tragedy. It's a tragedy. And it's crazy because right now, man, even in the church, there's clicks parsing off and clicking up and da 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 Right now, man, nobody can agree, disagree with anybody and still love you. Like, like we can't disagree and and love one another anymore. It, it's literally impossible. impossible. That is the narrative. Because after all, if you believe in wearing a mask, you are a partisan hack with no faith. That, that's just, that's the narrative. And, and if you believe in not wearing a mask, then you hate mankind, you want everybody to die, and you are a super spreader. That's literally what they're telling us. Like, this are the two contrasting narratives that are pulling us apart constantly. It can't be that we just simply disagree. We can't agree because first of all, nobody else can agree either. Even the, the people who are supposed to know, they, they, can't, they can't agree. So how are we to agree? But yeah, we can disagree, still love one another and be in unity. But, but you know what? You know what's happening? What's happening in the world is affecting what is happening in the church. And that is so backwards. What is happening in the church should be impacting the world. Yes. If the church was being the church of Jesus Christ, being crucified in Christ, no longer living, no longer living, but living for him, the world would be turned upside down by a bunch of crazy Christ followers, a bunch of Jesus freaks on the street. Yeah. So true. See, we're being led by the flesh instead of by the spirit. We're being led by the flesh and not by the spirit. 
Listen to me, the Bible says very clearly, the, the Bible says we got a lot of Bible today, amen. amen. A lot of the word of God. God said, just stay in the word, Keith, stay in the word because that's where it's at. It's the word, stay there. Okay, no problem, God, done. The Bible says that we are to make every effort, fight to maintain the unity of the body and the spirit with the bond of peace. Fight with everything that is within us. Why? Because there's only one God, one father of all of it, and he's the head of everything. He's the head of it all inside the church. See, we can't allow disunity to infiltrate the body. We can't let it happen. Why? Because a house divided cannot stand. You're seeing this in our own country, by the way. As it continues to divide, it won't be able to stand. It's just, it's just the law, right? It's, it's, it's God's word. House divided will not stand. It cannot. The enemy loves that the church is going at each other right now and fighting and bickering and treating churches, Facebooks like a, a political site to, to commentary back and forth. Praise God, drives me absolutely nuts. Absolutely crazy. Because see, Paul reminds us of, in Ephesians something very, very, very profound that we need to hold on to. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's not against each other. It's against the spiritual forces of wickedness and darkness. Against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. It's not even here. The battle's not here. But our weapons of our warfare are not carnal. But they're mighty to the pulling down of stronghold. Did you know our weapon is not Facebook? Our weapon is not Instagram. Our weapon is not statistics. Our weapon isn't even our own voice. That'll mess people up. It's not even our own voice. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not of the flesh whatsoever. None. There is no flesh in it. But they're mighty to the pulling down of strongholds. See, our weapon is prayer. Amen. <laughs> Why? Why? Because we believe as Christ followers who have died to Christ, who have died in him, we believe that our prayers are powerful and effective. They're powerful and effective, our prayers are. See, we believe as, as Christ followers, right, that worship is our weapon. Why? Because God inhabits the praises of his people. And when Jesus shows up on the scene, he takes over the entire scene. And every nation, every tribe, every tongue will bow at his feet. This is why, this is our, these are our weapons. Our, our, our weapons are the word of God. The word of God. This is the sword of the spirit. That's the sword of the spirit. It's living, it's active, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It divides bone from marrow and spirit from soul. It's discerning what is flesh and what is spirit. This is why we keep our face in it and seek his face so we don't get mixed up in all this other garbage that is happening. So we don't get, we don't get mixed up. Listen to me, Jesus said this. He says, faith comes from hearing and hearing from what? The word of God. And faith the size of a mustard seed, what? Can tell a mountain to be cast into the sea. And it has to because just a little bit of faith, if you have just a little bit of faith, nothing is impossible for you. Nothing. That's the Bible. But, but, but the church is acting out of pocket. They're acting out of pocket. They they don't know that they're the beloved or something. They, they don't know their identity. And so they're getting mixed up in all this, this other political garbage. Getting mixed up in it. See, when the beloved see the turmoil happening around them and the lawlessness that is taking place all around them, what do they do? They hit their knees. They don't hit Facebook. They lift up the name of Jesus in the midst of it. That's what they do because they believe in him. I believe that he is everything I need in every moment that I need it. I don't need Jesus plus. I don't need it. On either side of the aisle, Jesus plus any of it. Because the fact of the matter is this, there's a lot of people who are lost in this world. A lot of lost people. And Jesus said, I came to seek and to save those who are lost. Not those that agree with you or disagree with you. That's not what I'm here for. I'm not here for any of it. I'm not choosing any of your sides. I'm here to take over your life. I need you to be crucified in me. That's what I need you to do so that you can love people and show them me. Because no eye has seen God. No eye has seen God. But people will see God through the way you love one another. First John. It's incredible. 
We're to fight. You know, it's so funny. I remember one time I was, because I'm, I'm going to tell you, this really, really, really hits at the root of who I am. I'm a fighter. I'll fight every little thing. I really will. I actually enjoy it a little bit. Like, I don't mind confrontation whatsoever. Actually, I thrive. But anyway, so <laughs> it's really bad. That's my flesh, though. That's not the spirit, by the way. So I'm like, Lord, help me. Help me. Help me. But this was really hard on me. And I remember one time I was, I was dealing with this, this man. And, and, and man, I was trying to witness to him, but he was fighting me. He was fighting me. He was arguing with me. He, was, he had all these facts as he was some kind of, you know, biologist person with a whole lot more degrees than I ever thought of having. And I mean, I was going at him, man. And I, I thought I was really getting him. You know what I mean? Like messing him up with all of his theories and God and God and all these things. And it was so funny. The Holy Spirit spoke to me in that moment and said, would you quit fighting against him and fight for him? For God's sake. Stop fighting the guy. Fight for the guy. And man, I shifted the way I talked. I shifted the way I acted. And man, the Holy Spirit entered the conversation and the guy's heart just began to get soft. Amen. See, we, we really got to stop fighting against people and start fighting for them. Am I saying we agree with them? No, I'm not agreeing with any of it. If you know me, you know me. But I am saying fight for them. Stop going on Facebook and ranting and doing all this other garbage, man. Start praying for people, worshiping the God that created us, being in the word of God to show us love and how we love in the midst of this hard, hard and divided time. We can't allow the love of ourselves and for other people. We can't allow it to grow cold because the one who endures to the end will be saved. The one who loves to the end. Don't allow the world and what's happening out there destroy the way the beloved love people. Don't let it happen. You can't let it happen. That's the warning Jesus is issuing in Matthew chapter 24. That's the warning to the body. And as the signs of the times continue to unfold over these next however many years and days, we will need one another greater and greater. Did you know that? The, the Bible says do good unto others, but especially those in the body. We're not to fight against them, and we especially aren't supposed to be fighting within here. <laughs> We're not supposed to be doing it. Our need for each other will become greater and greater. And listen to me, this isn't easy, and this doesn't feel good. I know it doesn't. But yet it's exactly what God instructs us to do. What he commands of us, to love one another. Love your enemy. Pray for those that curse you. Bless those that hate you. This is what it says. This is how the world will know that you're mine because love is your calling card. And if we can do that to the very end, then we'll be saved. That's what he's saying. That's what he's saying. And we do that how? By realizing we are his agapeatos. We are only worthy of love. We are his beloved. And so he's telling us to love this way because he loves us. And he wants us to experience an even greater measure of his love. Come on and stand to your feet. We're going to land this plane. See, 1 John chapter 3 says, says this. This is what it says. It says that we know that we have passed from death to life by our love. We know that we have passed from death to life by our love. So, in other words, let me tie it all together. We will know that we've been crucified in Christ. That it's no longer I who lives, but it's Christ who lives in me when we love. When we love those who hate us. When we pray for those and bless those that curse us. This is when we know we have stepped out of death and into life. That's what it's saying. And this is tough because it doesn't make sense to the flesh, right? Like, it doesn't make sense. Like, yeah, we, we, we gotta fight. We gotta, da, 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 we gotta. But the Bible doesn't say that. I don't know what to tell you. Like, it doesn't say it. <laughs> it doesn't say it. These people dealt with way more persecution than any of us dealt with in our lives. And the whole time, the whole message, even Paul, the apostle, the whole message, Further the gospel, further the gospel, further the gospel. Not overthrow the government, further the gospel, further the gospel, further the gospel. That's all he says the whole time while locked up in prison. Nero killing thousands upon thousands of Christians day in and day out. Not a word. 
Preach the gospel. Preach the gospel. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. That's the entire message over and over and over and over and over and over until it literally makes your mind explode. Like what? Understanding the historical content and the context would really give us an enlightening thing of who God is. Our battle's not against flesh and blood. It's not against it. I've learned to be in content, Paul says, in all seasons. I've learned to abase and abound when things are good, things are bad, because I know I'm his beloved. I know I'm his agapeotos. And hear me, in the body, in the body, unity in the body will bring about God's glory. It's the way God will cause his glory to fall on a church is because the unity in the body. Think about the early church. When they all met together and they were in one accord, one accord, the glory of God showed up like a mighty rushing wind. Now we've got to be unified. And our weapons, man, we, we, we got to start praying. If my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray, right? pray, I'd hear from heaven. Pray, worship, and get in our word. Get our face in his book so we can seek his face and look more like him. Start fighting on behalf of those around us and those that we encounter and praying for people, speaking life over, over people. And Father, I pray right now that each and every one of our hearts, Lord, we would see this love you've called us into this love, God. We thank you, God, that you are slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. We thank you for that. And I pray today, Lord, you would continue to draw us in to show us this love you have designed for us to operate in. Give us revelation in it, God. We need you to strengthen us in order to do it, Lord. Help us to fix our eyes on you, Jesus the author and perfecter of our faith. Help us to have stamina and endurance so that we last till the end. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.